Grace and peace, Brother Sean here. If I can be heard, please type a seven. All right. Yes, I think we're all queued up. Hmm. Give thanks, give thanks, bless up. Shabbat Shalom to everyone who are here in the live live stream, as it's called, the live feed. If anybody needs to contact me or check out our channel, get your free calendar for this year. You have some articles to read at zineofjaw.net. And if you want to link me up, WhatsApp or email, feel no way. As always, all praise and glory to Jawa Father and his son, Joshua, the Messiah of Nazareth, who died for our sins that we may have eternal life. Also known as Yahshua, Yahawashai, Yahusha HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, Joshua the Messiah, Yeshua the Christ, or Yeshua the Anointed. Yeshaya is also another name that many people use. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Jah. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us for our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us out of all temptations and deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever in the authority and love of your son, Joshua, the Messiah, our Savior, we always pray. Amahin, so be it. Psalms 68 verse 4 from the King James Bible reads, Sing unto God, sing praises to his name, Extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name, Jah, and rejoice before him. So as you know, we use the name Jah for the father and Joshua for the son. Many other people use Yah and whatnot. But for those people who read the King James Bible and for those, there's many people in the world that they use the King James Bible and they, they're not worried about, let's call it the sacred name. So they'll still use Lord God, Jesus, which is nothing wrong with that. But just good to know that Jah is in the scripture, Psalm 68, verse 4. It's in there one time, right, in terms of in the English, where we see the words of the Lord. When we look at this Psalm 68, verse 4, and we go back to even the 1536 Geneva Bible, you'll see the spelling I-A-H, or looking like Aya, Ja, or Ya. In the King James original 1611 edition, it's written in calligraphy, as you can say, see here, with J-A-H. Some will say this is the I-A-H. It's definitely not a Y. But if you also trans uh, look at the Roman 1611, where they just they fix the calligraphy, it's capital I-A-H. Aya, Ja, Ya. The modern King James version, like I just read, has Ja. The new King James and as well as some Hebraic versions, will use Ya. And even modern English watered-down versions, they take out the name altogether and they put the word the Lord. And we know the, that the term the Lord is not a name. So we see that there's a, a little bit of a controversy with the I, the J, and the Y. And we're well, well aware that many people say that there was no J in ancient Hebrew. And I mean, that's something that you know, is very, very debatable and arguable. Actually, it's not even true, to be honest. The J sound never came into existence in the 1500s. We can talk about the letter J another time and when that came in, but you'll see that just like how you see on your screen, the J was, is the J replaced basically the capital I that way, and it still carried the same sound. That's another story for another time, but I just want to kind of put that out there. We don't discriminate if any of any people in the world use the names that you see on your screen right now. Shabbat Shalom again to all those coming in. So we can see that this Hebrew, Greek, and Latin is something that I get from scriptures. So let's take a read from John chapter 19. 
verse 19. And it reads, And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, I'm just reading it how it is, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus, or Jesus, was crucified, was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. As you can see on your screen, you know, I have these letters, these characters underneath, um, you know, the term. So I believe that the, the ancient Hebrew has the J sound, not the letter J, but the J sound. Again, I'm not going to be getting into it, but the Greek also deals with the Y and the Latin deals with the I. The letter I in Latin is called Y, which really means the Greek Y. And so my understanding is that the Hebrews and the ancient Israelites were black people and that the modern Hebrew that you see coming forth today is almost like a European type of Yiddish modernized watered down Hebrew, but they control all the rules because they've been controlling things for the last little while. And so you'll kind of get this, you know, idea or this notion that there was no J sound in the ancient Hebrew. Now that might be true for the Gentile Greeks and the Gentile Romans or the Latins that way, but my understanding, again, there's a big controversy, and you can check out one of our lessons online called My Name is Ja, or Ja is God's Name, part one, and part two will be coming out later on this year. So for those who might make a, a strife or a big to-do or have contention, we don't have contention with anybody that uses, you know, an, a name that they've understood, whether it's Ja, Ya, Aya, Yahawashai, Joshua. We do understand that we can go by our studies to show that there is a J sound, but nonetheless, you know what? It's a silly division and a silly argument for those to kind of cause a great division because they're not using certain names when we're all reading, well, not all of us, but the King James Bible tends to be one of the versions that most Israelite groups use. And, you know, I'm not going to say most everybody because there's new translations that are coming out now are really, really numerous that say that way. But anything that you see on your screen, if you refer to the most high by any of these names or even names that you don't see, again, hold no strife. Just be sure that you're keeping the commandments of the Father, you're keeping the commandments of the Messiah, and you have the testimony of the Messiah, and you have faith in him and believe in his resurrection and death and birth. These are the most important things. And as you know, the ancient Israelites, they didn't have to worry about who was an Israelite or what color they were. They didn't have to worry about what was the most high's name and what was the true calendar. But yet having all these true things, you can see that they slipped because of disobedience. They didn't slip because they didn't know how to pronounce the name anymore or got lost, that some might say. But it's due to rebellion to the Most High's commandments, laws, and statutes of love. So keep these things so that you can stay and remain in his love and really show him that you know his name and his son's name. Today's date is the 25th day of Elul, the sixth month for the year 6222 from creation. It's the last Sabbath of the first three month summer season. Don't get scared, it's not the six month long summer season, but the early summer, if you wanna call it that, or former summer season of three months, yes, it's coming down to a wind this week. Today's date is equivalent to the Gregorian date, July 30th, 2022 AD on the Sabbath. When we look at our almanac, our monthly almanac and calendar for Elul, which is also equivalent to July. And this year, July, uh, Elul started on July 6th. So right here where we are now is we're on the 5th, which again is equivalent, as I said, to July 30th. And there we can see that on the study almanac, there's various scriptures that you can check for yourself to verify certain dates and time frames within the scripture. And as you can see, again, this is the last Sabbath. And next month, next Sabbath, the beginning of that seven-day Sabbath is the month Ethanim. It's the seventh month. It's autumn. It's the beginning of the time or season of ingathering. Now, in regards to that date that you see here, let me just go back quickly. You can see there's a Nehemiah chapter 6, 15 under 25. And there's also a Haggai 1, 15. I won't read the Haggai right now, but the Nehemiah, we can give it a read. It reads, so the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month Elul in 50 and 2 days. So, I mean, there's no real great point about bringing these, um, this information out here right now, per se. 
um, it does have a, a little understanding when you get into these time frames. But just letting us know that these dates of the Most High are chrono, you know, I should say they're chronicled in a certain way in the scriptures. And with Jaz Almanac, his true scriptural calendar, you'll be able to plant all of the dates uh, of the year throughout the year on every given set date. And we'll be talking a lot about calendars and ethanim next month, uh, next week, sorry, next Sabbath. Um, I guess it would be next month anyways, but next Sabbath and uh, get into some details about calendars and the Feast of Trumpets. This is just going to be an introduction as we prepare for this holy season coming upon us. Again, shalom to all those who have come in the room. Bless up and thank you for stopping by. So giving some information, as you know, for us in Zion, we don't deal with the Enoch calendar or the Jubilee calendar, but the understanding of having 364 days in a common year is very true. Now, I know that after a few years, because it's 364 days, you would notice that um, if you're following it, that the seasons would be like, say, let's say after six, six years, the seasons would be kind of moving, shifting like six days due to the equinox and the solstice that keeps ourselves governed within the seasons, which are really the middle of the seasons and not the beginning. But however, every seventh year, you're going to get an extra seven days put in there at the end of that month. Now, I've been asked before, you know, where can you get this information in scripture? And there's some things in scripture that you're not going to see, especially regarding the calendar, and has to be understood by, let's say, scriptural principles or putting a little here and a little there. And so, in terms of, uh, let's just think about the seven seals of Revelation. So, you know, within the seven seals, in that seventh seal, there's seven trumpets. And then in that seven trumpets, in the seventh trumpet, you're going to have seven vials or seven plagues. So this is a little bit of an understanding when you know about the scriptures, the 28-year cycle, and these things may, may you know, kind of be familiar to you or may not. They may be new. But with this understanding, you can see how seven days in the seventh year, every seventh year, we have that week. And then at the end of a 20-year cycle, we're going to have the double-up week or two weeks at the end. Now, I know I'm just saying this off in my head and you want to see the, you know, the proof of it, but you'd have to just watch the other videos. And most of the videos, at least half, 50% to 60% on this channel will cover that information regarding calendars greatly. And also, I want to say one last thing. Be on the lookout for my other channel coming out, The Watchman of Zion, where we're going to have a little bit of shorter videos. And those videos are going to be like, let's call them um, like trailers to the longer studies. But I'm going to compact the information in a lot shorter videos, maybe go from seven minutes to 12 minutes. And maybe sometimes it might just be a two minute video explaining certain doctrines, being concise, succinct. And of course, I won't be able to, it won't be expanded, but they'll always lead to a video that's on this channel that you can verify the information. So right now we're just looking at, we have jazz months on the left, the Gregorian equivalent and the number of days in each of jazz months. So we see that we understand that February is the beginning of the year. And this year was February the 6th. That would be equivalent to a bib one. And there's always, 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 28 days in a bib. We don't use the lunar cycle at all. We don't use the Enoch monthly count of 30 days, 30 days, then 31 days, where they add another day and they say it's a day being added, but it's not really a day, but it is a day, but it's not a day um, that way. So everything that you see on the screen is these are fixed days of the month. They're not going to change. The first month will never be 29 days or 30 days. It'll always be 28 days. And the same goes for the following months and their equivalency for this year. So you got Zif, the second month, being 31 days. Savan, the third month, being 30 days. And of course, in the blue, that is dealing with the latter rain season. It's color-coded. And the beginning of summer is in May, or we call that Judah. And the reason why we call this month Judah, just to put it out there, is because the fourth month is known as, uh, I think it's Tammuz. And Tammuz is, uh, is it the fifth month. I think Tammuz might be the fifth month. And the fourth month is not mentioned in scripture. So what we've done is we've um, taken out Tammuz because that's a pagan god. And we just looked at the order of the Israelite um, tribes of Israel that they were born. And Judah was the fourth born. And Dan was the fifth born. So for those two months that you can't be found in scripture, 
And again, the one Tammuz is shouldn't even be there. We've just put in Judah, call it Judah and Dan. But if you don't like the names, remember everything is still on a numerical value. So you can just, if you don't want to name the months, you just have them month one, month two, so on and so forth. So this is the beginning of summer. And we are here now in Elul. Elul is a 31-day month. And the last day of Elul will be next week, the day before the Sabbath, because the seventh month, Ethanim, that you see on your screen, will always forever begin on the seventh day of the week. And we'll talk about that shortly. So we have Bull. Then we have Kislu, which is October. At the end of October or the end of Kislu, we start getting into winter, or we call the early rain seasons. So again, you just what you're seeing here is all the days on a common year of 364 days. There's six common years, then we have a sabbatical year. Then you have six common years, then you have a sabbatical year. And this is for this year for 6222 means 6222 years since year one or since the beginning of creation when Adam and Eve were made and Genesis chapter one. And of course, it's equivalent to the Gregorian value of 2022 AD. So this is how the how the um, the calendar maps out in this form, in a list form. And I want to show you a couple of other ways to look at the calendar. You could look at it again, just like how you have like a wall calendar, so to speak. And you can see over in the top left, and this is a common year of 364 days. What I just explained on the last slide, you can see there's 28 days in a bib. You go to the second month. There's 31 days. Then you go 30. And remember, all this green up here is the latter rain season. If you look at the top left, these charts explain a lot. You could call it spring, the latter rains, a bib is equivalent to February. In there, you have the Passover, the crucifixion of the Messiah, the resurrection of the Messiah, and the waving of the sheep, all occurring in this month. And the highlighted numbers with red um, are the holy festival times, as well as the beginning of the months. And then we got to the third month, because we're going to be mentioning those today. That's Savan. We have in there the Feast of First Fruits, or called Pentecost. It was the time of the Messiah's birth. He was born in spring, not in autumn. And it's also the time of the giving of the Holy Spirit to the 12 apostles to begin the ministry. So then we get to summer. Again, Judah, we called it number four. It's May. And these are all... Jaws Almanac numbers. There's no Gregorian figures on this chart at all. So every every month that you see starts on that certain day that's highlighted, like the number one, that's how it's going to be all the time. It doesn't shift. It doesn't change. The amount of days doesn't change. Jaws Almanac, his scriptural Almanac, is fixed and set, just like the seventh, the seventh day Sabbath and just like his holy festivals. So here we are. Um, we're over here in Elul. We're on the 25th, if you remember me saying. So we got another six days before we jump into Ethanim here, number seven, the beginning of autumn or in gathering. We have our festivals of trumpets, the Day of Atonement, Tabernacles, and the eighth day. And they're all highlighted here as well. And you can see which day of the week they, they begin on. Now, then we go into winter, 10, 11, 12. That's the early rains. And as, as it goes over, again, going back up to the top, this is where you have the latter rains. So this is the beginning of the winter season over here in November. And remember, we're saying that the spring equinox, the summer solstice, the autumn equinox, and the winter solstice are the middle of jazz seasons. They're not the beginning. Yes, they're the beginning of the Gregorian astronomical seasons, but that's, if not one of the, the greatest errors, lies, and deception of the last few centuries because everybody and their grandmother, you know, would sell, uh, would, let's say, recognize that these, um, the, the equinox is the beginning of spring, the summer solstice is the beginning of summer, and it's been like that for, for a long time, maybe a thousand years or so, but you have to understand that this is kind of, even though it's been the last thousand years, it's been changed, and when you look in time, you will see that for the most part, the ancient calendars, these were the middle of the seasons, just as they are on the scriptural calendar. Again, that's just some information to kind of fill people in. I know people have been getting a lot of requests about more information about the calendar. And um, 
this is where you're going to have to put it out. Again, this is not a full calendar uh, discussion lesson today, but we will be going back and forth in certain understandings. Now, first of all, I have to say is that the Revelation of Jazz Almanac is a book that was put out many years ago. It was first released in the year 2000. It was written before that. We did a, a republishing of it or a revision of it that was put out maybe about three or four years ago. And the author is David Ray. And David Ray, we considered the elder or the founder. I even say he doesn't like to be called elder. He was the founder of what we call the Zion Assembly of Jah. And he had written five books, The Revelation of Jah's Almanac, The Moon in the Month, Abib, The First Scriptural Month, Sea Time, Harvest, Summer and Winter in the Land of Israel, or Jazrael, as we would say sometimes, and Zion and Babylon. Now, I have to say, probably one of the greatest revelations in the scriptural world for the last thousand years is Jah's true scriptural calendar. I know that many people have a similar understanding to Jah's calendar. They might call it the Enoch. And I've even heard of others that utilize the sabbatical years the same way that we teach from the scriptures as well. But nonetheless, this calendar cannot be gainsaid. It has everything that you need from the beginning of time. We know when all the festivals are from the very first festival in Egypt. It's going to be on the same day of the week to weigh in the future. We have these understandings of chronology, of how to count years and where we are, prophetical time frames in terms of the times of the Gentiles. And when you start counting the amount of years in the book of Daniel, when you start utilizing the prophetical calendar in Revelation. And I have to say, I know that the prophetical calendar utilizes 360 day years and 30 day months. And that's true. But that's a prophetical calendar used specifically for prophecy and how to count prophecy and uh, prophetical years as well. But the civil calendar that, you know, Israelites use to observe the festivals is not the 360 day calendar at all. It's the 364 because on the 360 day calendar, the number seven can't work out evenly anyways. And as well, it'll have all the festivals just moving all around and being shifted here. And if you think adding seven days every seven years might sound kind of weird, if the 360-day calendar was in, in uh, utilization, it's even more and more confusing. So it's, again, it's a prophetical calendar. We utilize it, but it's not the same as the civil calendar. These books, if anybody wants to contact me, I put my email um, earlier on, you can email me. And for the time being, you might be able to get yourself a copy of the Revelation of Jazz calendar. And the other books will be following up um, very soon. That way, we're still thinking about, you know, trying to just use some of these things to kind of bring in a little bit of money for the work that David had put into the into um into the work they put into these books to try to keep things self-supporting. And I didn't, I, I don't think I mentioned, but David Ray had passed away in the year 6219 or 2019, and um, he was complete. In, in his work. He finished off his work. He's been a great mentor to me, um, a, a great mentor to me. I've learned a lot of things, even through the hard way. And I have to say one thing about David was very humble. He's very meek, soft-spoken, and going to be one of those men that, you know, is not famous and great that way. But as you know, once Ja recognizes your work, that's all that matters. So I just want to put this information out there. Again, if you want a copy of the Revelation of Jaws Almanac, you got to email me. Or if you got my WhatsApp, you can do it that way as well. Free of charge for now. But the other books, we'll see. So we're preparing for the Autumn Feast and the coming of the Messiah. They're both linked. And so this is some information that we want to teach that the autumn feast, the fall feast, the ingathering feast, the end of the harvest season feast, all are synonymous, deal with the Messiah's second coming. And this is this information is kind of uh, known out there for many people who get into calendars and they like the prophetical understandings of the trumpets. But I still know that a lot of people teach that the Messiah was born in, in um, autumn or the Feast of Tabernacles. When that's incorrect, he was born during lambing season in the spring season.
because all the spring festivals you'll see represent his first coming and the fall festivals represent his second coming. So with that understanding, I mean, outside of many other things, you know, should be able to point people in the direction that the Messiah was not born in autumn. So next Sabbath is the first day of Ethanim, the seventh month for the year 6222, equivalent to August 6, 2022. It's the Feast of Trumpets and the beginning of autumn in gathering, including seed time. Yes, of course, the word autumn is not in scriptures, but the understanding of the season is. All right, let's continue. So this is for those preparing to keep, you know, the, the festivals at these times. Now, I know most people and um, most groups, they deal with the equinoxes and solstices. So most people will be having in September, they're going to be doing trumpets, tabernacles. And whenever the dates kind of go along to the moon, they'll do it in September. And here we are doing it in August, a month, they would say a month behind, but they're actually a month ahead. And there's a little bit of an error with this. If you um, know the story about uh, Jeroboam and his false festival of the eighth month, this understanding again, I don't want to keep sounding like I could plug my, I'm only plugging my channel, but I can't explain all of that here and now, but you'll see that this, this uh, Jeroboam switch to having a false feast in the eighth month was a big calendar switch. And I do believe from my studies and from what I learned from the most high is that you know, the calendar that's used as a lunar calendar today is actually Jeroboam's calendar or any calendar that uses the equinoxes and solstices have been led away in, let's call it the Jeroboam era. So on your screen, you're just going to, you're going to get the festivals for this upcoming August and putting it out there. And if you want to join us and, and keeping these festivals, trumpets, atonement, tabernacles in the eighth day, feel free. And if you want to just continue to study you can do so yourself, but I would encourage you to really research the lunar calendar because nothing should be kept in September at all. That's for the heathens and the pagans. Not saying our Israelite brothers are heathens and pagans, but the calendar that they're following is a heathenistic astronomical loony solar calendar. So we have the Feast of Trumpets, so we'll highlight that first. That's going to be beginning, as I said, next week from Friday, 7 p.m. Some people want to go 7.30 or when the sun sets, you know, feel no way. That's your understanding. But when you deal with a 12-hour day, 7 p.m. to 7 p.m. is also scripturally good. Even if you don't see the sun fully dark, it's a good understanding about the 24-hour day and the seasons. Then 10 days later, on August 15th, which is a Sunday evening from 7 till 7, which is the second day of the week, we'll have the Day of Atonement. Now, that's no work, no food or water, a strictly a fast of 24 hour day uh, for a 24 hour day. Then we have the week of tabernacles plus the eighth day, and that begins August 21st, going to August 28th, a Sunday to Sunday. All the year, the week long festivals or the seven day festivals or eight day festivals on the Most High's calendar are attached to the weekly cycle. So the first day of Passover will be on the first day of the week. And the first day of Tabernacles will be on the first day of the week, likewise. So we have the first day of Tabernacles here, August 21st, 7 till 7. No work to be done, but you can have a festival. And then eight days later, so to speak, we have the eighth day, the last great day of the feast. And again, that's on the first day of the week. The, the scriptural date is Ethanim 23, 7 till 7 as well. So there we have it. Maybe you can screenshot it. I'll keep it on the screen for another few seconds. But these are the accurate and true dates for this year's calendar uh, festivals for the seventh month. And when we take a look here, this is the seventh month for this coming year. You can see that top right, August the 6th, the Feast of Trumpets. And again, one of the unique things about the Most High's calendar is that the seventh month is the only month that it starts on the seventh day Sabbath. Every other month, all the 11 um, other months, they begin on either the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, or sixth day, uh, six days of the week. None of them begin on the seventh day, which is very important to know. That's due to Jah's scriptural design. There's a very great mystery to that. 
but the first day of the seventh month would be a Sabbath day. And just like the first day of every scriptural year will always be on the first day of the week. It's not going to be in the middle of the week like the Enoch calendar. It's not going to be shifting, wandering around like the lunar solar calendar as well. It's fixed, perfect. It keeps in line with the seasons. Nothing goes out of whack. The festivals are true. They're there. And the seasons are actually very accurate. For those in Toronto, I don't know if you've been noticing already, we're getting a little shift of the seasons. The breeze is coming in. Watch those kind of clouds that are like looking like they're flat, like they're hovering on something. Listen for the sound of the cicada uh, insect with the loud electricity sound. That zzzz. Get ready for the winds to pick up. Your evenings might be a little bit cooler. Now, don't get me wrong. You're still going to get hot days and hot times. But on a general aspect, starting from now, you start to see certain things shifting over. And even some birds that are not normally here for the first three months of summer, they're going to be coming through as well as some butterflies and whatnot. So these are things that I've noticed over the years being in Toronto that it's been accurate all the time. So again, we're looking here, we can see the Day of Atonement. When we said it was on the 15th, we have the Festival of Tabernacles for one week from the 21st of August to the 28th, which is really the 16th of Ethanim, or the end of the 15th day at evening. And here we have it, all the holy festivals for this upcoming month. Again, screenshot it if you want. You could actually go to truetalks.ca. That's truetalks.ca. I'll put it in the chat. And you can get this year's calendar. I think I still got it up there. And with that, you can download the same calendar for the whole year, along with other information. So again, we're having this preparation here. Psalms 81.3. Blow up the trumpet in the new month, in the time appointed, on our solemn feast day. So I, I, as you see on your screen, you should be well acquainted with that. It's a shofar or a ram's horn. And it's something that is sounded, usually we sound them every the beginning of every month. But on the beginning of the seventh month, it's like a memorial of trumpets. So you're kind of sounding it off a little bit more, um, adding it to your assembly um, ceremony, so to speak. I say ceremony, our worship, assembly worship that way. But it's a time, again, as a memorial, looking back at this festival, as well as it looking forward to its prophetic fulfillments. Shalom again to everybody coming in the room. Now, it's important to know that the Feast of Jah are his prophetic plans of the salvation of, of the salvation through his son. Now, we wouldn't be talking about a calendar, and a calendar wouldn't mean anything if it wasn't to meet with the Most High on his festivals. Now, I know a lot of groups, especially mainstream Christendom, they will teach that the festivals are done away with. He nailed them to the cross. He fulfilled them. When we're in him, we're keeping the festivals. But that's... a uh, a lot of a mixed up truth. There's a lot of lies in that. We should be keeping the festivals. And all the festivals, yes, they point to the Messiah's salvation. And they all have different aspects that show us about whether it's his birth, his death, his resurrection, his second coming. They are all very important and deal with our salvation. They're shadows of things to come. So this information about festivals is kind of, now it's starting to come to light a little bit more. But when you talk to people that might be in Christianity that way, they're going to go, oh, you know, we don't need to do those things. Yet they'll keep Christmas, they'll keep Easter and all these pagan things that are not in the scriptures. And then the scriptural feast, they don't want to keep them. I just say that, you know, if, you, if you're still on the fence, do a little bit more research, pray, and you'll come to a good understanding. The Father will lead you the right way. He's not going to lead people away from not keeping the festivals. That I can assure you. He's leading people by his spirit to obey him to meet with him at his appointed times and his son. And these things are still in play. The Messiah kept the festivals. The apostles kept the festivals. We read Paul kept, kept the festivals. Pentecost, the Day of Atonement. Right? These things are all in the New Covenant writings. And a lot of people say, well, why doesn't it mention how to keep them or anything like that? Well, because it's in the Old Testament. And people say, well, that's Old Covenant things. There's the Old Testament writings, and then there's the Old Covenant. Right? The covenant is old, but not the laws and statutes and the moral uprightness that we're supposed to live by. We're in the new covenant now. So being in the new covenant, we don't sacrifice animals. On the festivals, we don't sacrifice a lamb 
or any of those things, or when we sin, we don't bring forth a turtle dove or anything. We know that forgiveness of sins is in the Messiah. And he came to take away that sacrificial law because, I mean, what could animal, the blood of animals and goats do for us? It can't really clear sin, but it was symbolic of what the Messiah would do for us. And how could one man, how could his blood, you know, cover for, you know, millions and billions of people's sins if they accept him? Well, because he's more important than all of us, right? He is the creator of the universe, right? By the powers of his father. So his life is more valuable. Like if you to do a trade, Jah, you know, sent his son to die for our sins. But the devil probably thought if he can kill the, the Messiah, then for sure, you know, he can probably be rule this universe forever. So the Messiah's life is way more valuable than ours. And he laid it down for us so that we can try to stop, not try, so that we can stop sinning. And when we do sin, we have repentance, faithful repentance in his name, and we don't walk in those sins no more. So this is why these festivals and everything in the Messiah are important and why we forward the true calendar of the Most High. Now, from the beginning, from the Exodus, the Most High was calling his people, you know, to, to keep a feast unto him. Exodus chapter 5, it reads, And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith Jael of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Exodus 10, 8. And Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh, and he said unto them, Go serve Jael, but who are they that shall go? And Moses said, We will go with our young, and with our old, and with our sons, and with our daughters, with our flocks, and with our herds, we will go. For we must Hold a feast unto Jah. See, even when Jah comes back, Joshua and Messiah comes back, right? The Father's in him. When he comes back, we're going to have a feast, right? It's going to be a marriage feast at that time, but also the festivals are going to be kept in the 1,000 year reign. It says that in Zechariah, that people will be able to come to Jerusalem to keep these festivals once again. And the whole world will be invited for those who accept the Messiah. So back in the past, in, and back in the past of the Messiah too. And before that, the festivals were being kept. They're going to be kept in the future. We have to understand there's a principle. This is what the Most High wants. And not that the kingdom of heaven is about eating and drinking, right? And about food and drink and all of that stuff. No, but, you know, it's dealing with family, right? You, you eat and drink with those who are close to you. And Jah is a family, and he's made us a part of his family, and he wants to feast with us. Just like how he feasted with the 70 elders on the mountain with Moses and Aaron. This is something that is intimate with us and the Father. So it's important for those who are on the fence, don't let nobody kick away your feet and say you don't have to keep the festivals. Learn about them. Study them as much videos as you can get under your belt. I know it might be confusing, but take your time. And of course, read the scriptures to prove all things. Shabbat Shalom, again, family coming in. Now the kingdom of Jah and the feast of Jah have great relation. Second Ezra's from the book of the Apocrypha. It says, be ready to the reward of the kingdom for the everlasting light shall shine upon you evermore. Flee the shadow of this world. Receive the joyfulness of your glory. I testify my Savior openly. O oh, receive the gift that is given you, and be glad, giving thanks unto him that hath led you to the heavenly kingdom. Arise up and stand. Behold the number of those that be sealed in the feast of Jah, which are departed from the shadow of, this, of the world, and have received glorious garments of Jah. So again, another verse kind of showing us a prophetic fulfillment. When we keep these festivals, it's a part of our faith. And I mean, if somebody doesn't know about these festivals or know about the Sabbath day, you know, they have, they're, they're growing in their faith. They might have a little bit here at a lower level. But as you move in life and the Most High guides you, you increase in faith and you add more understanding to your faith. Because a lot of people just say, hey, if you believe and be baptized, you're going to be saved. And that's true in the big you know, uh, context of things that way. But then there's smaller things you have to do in there. If you believe, that means you'd be obedient because you believe that you should be walking in righteousness. The Ten Commandments, the holy words of the Most High. And I know sometimes the word law messes up people's mind because you have to really figure out which law we're talking about because there's quite a diff few different laws. But usually when 
Paul is talking about the law. It's talking about the moral upright law that we, you know, that will that will that we will be judged upon that which is good and evil. <clears throat> Exodus 23, three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. Now, notice here that it says three times, but it's not just three festivals we keep. There's seven holy convocations, right? And they have different holy days within them as well. But it's during these three times, the, the first month of the year, um, the third month of the year, which we can just call the latter rains, that spring season, and then the seventh month of the year, which is the beginning of the second half of the year. Or you can call it the ending of the year, the turning of the year, the circuit of the year. A lot of you know groups out there think that the seventh month is the first month of the year, but it's the seventh month. That's why it's called the seventh month. So it's three times. Let's read about these. Thou shalt keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded thee in the time appointed of the month of Bib. For in it thou camest out from Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. And the feast of harvest, which is the first fruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in thy field, in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in, <coughs> excuse me, thy labors out of thy field. Now, something to get a hold of is sometimes when you see this word harvest, you know, people always think of harvest as being the last part of, of the agricultural year. And really, what it is, is it's two different sets, sets of harvests. So we have like the grain harvest that start from a bib and go through to, to the end of the year or to the end of the agricultural year. And then you have the summer fruits harvest, you know, your vegetables, your fruits and all of those things, which go until the end of the year or till the end of the autumn season or the six month summer season. And that time, the Feast of Tabernacle is called the Feast of Ingathering. But when people see like in verse 16, when they see and the feast of harvest, they're thinking, oh, that's just the end. But the feast of harvest is actually the beginning of the harvest, and you reap all the way through for about five to six months, beginning from the first month of the year. And notice it says also the end of the year as well. So it's not like some people might think, hey, in the last month of the year, the very end of the year, this is when the festival is occurring. But it's in the seventh month. And so just look at the year as in two halves. You have the first half, from month one to month six, and then you have the ending half or the last part of the year from month seven to month 12. And this is why it says here, the end of the year, the turn of the year, it could even mean the middle of the year that way, when thou gathered in thy labors. So when everything is brought in and that begins in August and this lasts for three months. So these seasons are attached to festivals, but they again, three month periods. Exodus 34. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, shalt thou keep seven days, thou shalt eat unleavened bread, as I commanded thee in the time of the month of Bib. For in the month of Bib thou camest out from Egypt, and thou shalt observe the Feast of Weeks. That's also known, look up, that's the Feast of Harvest. So verse 16 is the Feast of Harvest, or the first fruits. That's as well the Feast of Weeks. Notice what it says, the Feast of Weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest. And verse 16 up top again, the Feast of Harvest, the first fruits of thy labor that you sown. Continuing, and the feast of gathering at the year's end. Three times or thrice in the year shall your man child appear before Jael, the El of Israel. So again, you see a, like a little bit of here, there, a little there. It's the beginning of wheat harvest, the Feast of Weeks, which starts, I mean, harvest starts in a bib, which is equivalent to February, the end of February, and it goes right through to the end of the year. It's wheat harvest, Feast of Weeks, first fruits, all the same thing. Now, at that time, of course, it says that your men shall appear before Jah all the time. And it didn't mean that women couldn't go, but usually there would be issues for women, like if they have on their menstrual cycle or if they were, let's say, pregnant or some issue of, of that nature. You would have a representative. Make sure you have a man. It could be the husband. It could be the father, grandfather that would appear to make this journey because this, this was a journey at that time. They were in the land. Yes, and they could all locally go if you were in Jerusalem, but you'd also have to travel far because it meant like Israel, the land of Canaan is it's not like you can just walk around, right? It's it's quite extensive. So they would have to journey and take some time, a few weeks to actually go down there, buggy and cart that way. So the men would be responsible in that sense. But now for all the festivals, and it always was women can partake of those things. Again, 
You know, there might be certain issues when it comes to a menstrual cycle. I know people might say, what are you talking about? Um, we just got to learn to put a difference between clean and unclean. And it's not only women can become unclean, men can become unclean too by various ways, whether it's sex, touching a dead body and uh, having a sore on your body, even being sick. And if you're like, the scriptures tell you, if you have a running issue, so if you have like a really runny nose and you're coughing up a storm, you don't go to the congregation on the Sabbath or the festivals because you're going to be contaminating it that way, right? And these are all spiritual things and I'm not going to be getting nitty gritty. I'm not going to be questioning who is on their cycle and how many days one should learn to count and understand these things for themselves. But nonetheless, we're all invited to the festivals. So Just Feast, as we have published for almost over 25 years, I think going into like 27 years now, are shadows and memorials of his mightiest acts in his scriptural almanac, his calendar of salvation. When they're celebrated before the event, that means that they foreshadow things to come. And when they're celebrated after the event, that means that they're memorials and they'll continue to be memorials for all time. So with the Most High's festivals, you, you can see even when it comes to the Passover, it, it was um, in the Messiah's time, it was foreshadowing the exodus from Egypt. And now when we keep it, it's also, it was, we're looking, not, I shouldn't say foreshadow, I should say it was a more mo memorial for Egypt. And now, now we in these times, it's still a memorial for Egypt, but it's also a memorial of the Messiah's um, sacrifice for us as well. But then it also points to a future time when the Messiah is going to come again and rescue us from Egypt, Babylon, the devil's world. So all of these things are symbolic. Bless up to those who have came in the room. Shabbat Shalom. And this is one of those verses here that people will say, hey, you know, you, we don't need to keep these things. Colossians 2, it reads, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, that's food, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new month, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. But the assembly, the body, is of the Messiah. So what we see here, first of all, is two different things. When you read Paul, I want to show you a little, understand when you read Paul's letters. Usually when he's talking about something, he uses what I would call duality comparison. So he'll say like, uh, he'll compare, doesn't like a man compared to a woman. And here what he's comparing is that let no man judge you from up top. But then he goes at the bottom and he says, but the body, and that means the, the body of believers, the congregation, the assembly, so-called wrongly the church is of the Messiah. They're the ones who will give you an understanding of how to do things. So he's comparing let no man to these Colossians judge them when they're re respecting these things or they're respecting the dietary law or the Sabbath day or anything that you see on your screen right now. And as you know, many people think that you're judging them because they don't keep the Sabbath. But I can't judge somebody in terms of how they keep the Sabbath if they don't keep the Sabbath. So he's talking to people here who are keeping these things, not if you don't keep them. Don't let nobody judge you if you don't keep the Sabbath. Don't let nobody judge you if you don't recognize the holy days or whatnot, or if you eat what you want. No, it's actually the opposite. So this year is actually a scripture letting us know we should keep these things. And why? Because it says there are a shadow of things to come. They represent the Messiah's second coming. One second here. Thank you. All right, let's continue. So let's take a look at the seven holy convocations and kind of give a, a basic, basic introductory breakdown of these seven holy convocations. Now, you know, seven is the most high number of wisdom. It's, it's great when it comes to calendars. It's great when it comes to prophecy and fulfillments of the things that the Messiah has done for us. You should know seven colors in the rainbow, seven notes in music seven assemblies or churches in revelation the seven spirits or the seven angels of the most high the seven locks of samson we can go on and on and on seven is like 
the most prominent, powerful number of wisdom in the scriptures. So what we have is the first day of Passover, his sacrifice and death. I also want to say this. If you want to read about the festivals in their basic form from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 23 is the chapter you should study and read. Give it a, a good overview. Don't worry about the sacrifices and the offerings. However, during Passover, yes, you must eat unleavened bread and have no leaven in your house. That's still the same, but no more sacrificing of animals that way. So the first day of Passover represents the Messiah's death. It's quite popularly known that he was killed on that first day of Passover. And then we have the seventh day of Passover, which is also a holy day that represents his ascension. It's also tied to the waving of the sheaf, which is the day after that Passover. Now, the waving of the sheaf isn't a holy day, so to speak, but it's a part of the Passover festival in terms of counting to the Feast of First Fruits. Might sound like a mouthful there, but we'll leave it for now. Then we have Pentecost, first fruits, or remember when we just read the Feast of Weeks, right? So that represents, we believe he was born during the, the Feast of Passover, uh, Feast of Pentecost, or first fruits. People say, well, no one really knows. Well, I think the scriptures know, and the scriptures actually have a lot of evidence to prove so. It was the day that the Holy Spirit, as I said before, was given to the apostles. It was also the day that the Ten Commandments more than likely were spoken. Now, when I say more than likely, I know I sound like I'm unsure a little bit. Okay, I think it actually could have been a couple of days in there, around there. But the way I see it in scripture, yes, I just don't want to kind of say something and be wrong and strong. However, though, for my studies, have led to that greatly. So the spring feasts represent his first coming, right? All that's above. And the fall feasts represent his second coming, all that you're going to see below. So the Day of Trumpets, what we're going to be celebrating next Sabbath, represents the seven trumpets before his coming. So when the Messiah, before the Messiah comes to earth, there's going to be seven seals. And then in that seventh seal, you're going to have seven trumpets, and the Messiah comes in the seventh trumpet. And it looks like the resurrection will be in the seventh trumpet as well, the first resurrection, that is, for those who are in the Messiah. So they're announcing these things, announcing the Messiah's second coming that way. The Day of Atonement, which is the fast, represents his arrival and resurrection. And you might say, well, didn't you say trumpets? Trumpets leads to it. But if you know anything about the Day of Atonement, that's the day that the only one day that the high priest can go into the Holy of Holies. And it was the only one day where the Most High would appear like in a cloud of smoke above the Ark of the Covenant, above the mercy seat that way. And it's in a cloud. And as well, the symbolism is here is that when the Messiah comes back again to the earth to atone and bring us back, you know, to the resurrection, be at one with him, he's going to come with clouds as well. And there's a great similarity. So be sure to check out all the festivals as we get to them in the seventh month in August. Tune in because we'll be getting into the great details and showing all the scriptural proofs to, you know, increase your faith in the Messiah. These are not old done away with uh, observances. Then we have the first day of tabernacles representing that 1,000 reign on the, on the earth with the Messiah when he comes to tabernacle with us and be with us. And then you have the eighth day of tabernacles, which represents the new creation, a new beginning. The number eight here represents like a new week and a new beginning. So it's ending one thing and then going into an, uh, a new beginning. And that means, you know, if you understand how, you know, Jah has his creation that way, the place is going to be burnt up in the end. There's going to be a judgment, burnt up, and then a new heavens and a new earth. This is going to, everything you see before you is going to be destroyed. It's not going to be refixed or polished up or just sin removed. It's going to be annihilated completely. And then a new heavens and a new earth is going to be created by the Most High. And we'll be there to see that. And we'll dwell there with him forevermore and go on into the next cycles of, of time and eternity forever and ever. So this is a good understanding here. You can share with people that the Messiah is in every single festival. I mean, it's always about him anyways. So we have these spiritual preparations for the fall feast. The holy days are fulfilled in the Messiah. So I always encourage, you know, when we had our small congregation and we used to gather together, be 
be preparing for this, right? For everything that comes around. Don't just wait to that day before atonement and you're going to really start being repentant. Start thinking about this. And I mean, we're supposed to be living anyways a repentant life all the time. But when it comes to the festivals, it gives us that good up opportunity to keep ourselves in line with the, with the Messiah and his father. The Sabbath day is perfect. Could you imagine if there was no seven day Sabbath? You know, we would just go off into oblivion doing whatever we want. I mean, people even ignore the Sabbath now, but it's a great reminder, right? And that's why he said, remember the Sabbath, because it reminds us about our creator and what he did for us and how he made everything and how he should be worshiped because he made the heavens, you know, and the earth and all that in them is. So these things help keep us in, in a, a memorial state of our creator, especially with the festivals as well. Matthew 13. Then Joshua sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that sows the good seed is the Son of Man, which is himself. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. So we see here that there is good children for the father and then there's evil children for the devil. And this is how it goes. There's vessels of honor and vessels of destruction. And this can kind of cause a, a problem for some of us, you know. Are you predestined to be a vessel of destruction or, you know, a vessel of honor? And something that we don't really initially know, but we know that the work has been done for us. Is we have to start believing and having faith and, you know, bringing forth the, these good deeds to show our faith, right? But to be honest, you potentially or I potentially could be a child of the wicked one or a child of the Most High. It depends upon us that way. Now, ultimately, it does, you know, judge the one who predetermines everything. But, you know, that's his prerogative. And he just tells us what to do and we try to follow suit. But do know that there's children of the devil, human beings that hate Jah, hate the scripture, hate him, might even use the scripture, and they're of like the devil. The devil cannot stand the fight. He hates him. He, what, he tried to kill him already. He killed his son, right? And lo and behold, what happened? Joshua conquered death and took away the strength of the devil. Because the devil, his power was in death. That's where he was able to kind of have his strength. But now we've conquered death through the Messiah. And so he has no more power over us at all. Praise his holy name. Verse 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest, here's the harvest again, the end of the world, the ingathering time. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. That's representing the lake of fire, obviously. The Son of Man, the Messiah, shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. Remember, iniquity is lawlessness. So, as a reminder, keep the Ten Commandments, right? Keep the Sabbath day holy. That's what you have to do. Not just look at it. Keep it holy. Don't pollute it. Eat clean food, clean meats that way. If you want to be a vegetarian, no problem. But you shouldn't be eating anything that is, you know, unsanctified by the Bible. It has to be sanctified by the Word of the Most High, not unsanctified. So whether it's shrimps, lobster, shellfish, of course, dogs, cats, pigs, and various birds, and fish that have fish, they have to have scales and fins. If you have fish that have fins and no scales, you can't eat it. If you have fish that might have scales but no fins, like an eel, so to speak, you can't eat it as well. So this is all a part of iniquity. And some people might say, well, that's just, you know, deeds and you're trying to get in by works. No, we're just trying to be holy like he's holy. I'm not holy, but he said, be holy, be like him, follow him. So we have to do these things and doing them, we do it in faith. I don't do it and you don't do it and say, hey, John, you owe me eternal life. No, I, I never, uh, like the man who came to the Messiah, I kept all the commandments. I don't eat unclean food. Uh, I need it. I give me eternal life. No, because the scripture says that. All have sinned and come short of the glory of Jah. And when it says the scripture concluded that and said that, that's what Jah said. So there ain't nobody, nobody who never mind has not sinned 
who doesn't have a sinful nature and even after learning truth might still sin as well because the sin is so powerful that way there is a law of sin and death and it's right there beside the law of life and that's just a deep understanding that way but there's none of us have done good so we can't earn our way into the kingdom but in order to show our faith we must obey right that's how it works if you want the holy spirit obey and again, you obey with the mind frame that you're just doing what the Father said to do. You're not going to be like the Pharisees and say, hey, I fast twice a week. I, I give tithes. I, uh, you know, I kept keeping all the festivals. Therefore, you know, where's my eternal life? Because that person is not admitting that there's sin in their life. And you can do all of those things, yes, and still be an evil person. You can keep the festivals. You can do all these things and still be evil in your life. So we have to be very diligent in this walk. Don't be a part of those things that are going to be cast out that do iniquity and things that offend him. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Pure pain. Right? Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who has ears to ears, let him hear. And I want to say something quickly about hell and the furnace and the lake of fire. Nobody's in there now. Not one person. Everybody, I mean... Everybody who dies goes to the grave. You could do your own research. And I think the word hell appears 64 times in both the Old and New Testament. And 64 is not a lot when it comes down to studying. That means if you study all those verses, you get a good understanding of what the word hell means in the Hebrew, which is Sheol. You get a good understanding of what hell means in the Greek, which is Hades. And also one time it translates as Giena fire, hell fire. You get a good understanding of what this word means. It means the grave. It's not a literal place where people are right now being burnt up and the devil's down there poking them and they're weeping and gnashing of teeth is going on right now. That's coming in the future. Everybody right now, <clears throat> excuse me, righteous or unrighteous are in the grave dead. Their body might have even deteriorated. The bones might have turned to dust because we go back to dust. We're from the earth. And so you go back to it. You don't go to heaven. You don't go... To hell or anything like that there's no immortal soul the soul that sins shall die so i just had to put that out there because i know still there's a lot of teachers putting things about hell and yes if you die you don't you know you disrespect the messiah you will go into hell fire in the future but right away when you die you don't go there because you know you're, you're dead right otherwise death won't mean death that means i'm not dead i'm somewhere else alive I went to a congregation today, a nice little small congregation of brothers and sisters, and taught a good lesson. But, you know, simply put, you know, when you're dead, he taught as well, you're, you know, you're dead. And he was talking about a conversation he had with somebody and about Whitney Houston when she died. And that person was like, oh, you know, Whitney's in a better place now, away from all the drugs and this and that. And I was like, what do you mean she's in a better place? Is she dead or is she in another place? Which one is it? And it kind of gave her, you know, he stuck her that way. But that's really what it's about. When you're dead, you're dead. So as we look at trumpets, which is coming up in seven days after today, again, it starts August the 6th. It's next week from Friday evening to Saturday evening. Seven till seven is the 24-hour period that we understand things. And even though the sun might be up a little bit because it's late in this season, you know, in the wintertime, sometimes the sun sets at 4.30. And so, you know, we just use a six-hour clock. It would normally be six till six because when you see in the scriptures, 6 p.m. is the time of evening, and you can see the scriptural clock in scriptures. It's just that with these guys and their cheesy daylight savings times or double satanic time, they just mess up this hour. But otherwise, it would normally be from 6 till 6. And I will say this. During this season right now, for the last few months in Jerusalem, and that's what I usually watch, the sun is setting at 7.30. 737, 7, it was at 738 one time, it's going down and whatnot. But 730 is when the sun sets in Jerusalem. That might not mean anything to anybody, um, but that'll actually be 630 proper time. And then sometimes it sets before six o'clock in Jerusalem. Leviticus 23. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month shall you have a what? A Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. So again, you can see here the first day of the month is going to be a Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath. Now, sometimes this word Sabbath does just mean a holy day. But when you 
understand the fest uh the, the the beginning of the months every month is like you know you blow the trumpet and it's it's almost like a sabbath but they're not sabbaths it's only the seventh month that you see in the scripture where it says you will have a sabbath it will be a seventh day sabbath and that is the only month in the 12 months that starts on the seventh day due to jah's holy design so it's a memorial of blowing of trumpets it's a holy convocation that means we must gather together with like-minded believers. Two or three are gathered, that's fine. Also, in the 10th day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation to you, and you shall afflict your souls, which means to fast, an offering, offering made by fire unto Jah. On the first day, this is now for the tabernacles. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. Seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire unto Jah. On the eighth day shall be an holy convocation unto you. You shall offer an offering made by fire unto Jah. It is a solemn or holy assembly. You shall do no servile work. These are the feasts of Jah, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire unto Jah, a burnt offering, a meat offering, a sacrifice, a drink offering, everything upon his day. So as you can see, if you're looking, paying attention to the verses, I went from verse 24, I skipped 25, 26, went to 27. But I just wanted to bring it out here in terms of just focus on uh, these four holy convocations. There are other standings about them if you read it between the lines. And please, don't. I don't just say I want you to. You, you should. It's a good chapter to be familiar with. On the Feast of Trumpets, occurring as it does on the first day of the seventh month, Ethanim has still yet to be fulfilled. And to my knowledge, nothing of great spiritual significance, which could be taken as a fulfillment of this feast, has ever occurred in our modern day. I believe it still awaits future fulfillment. I want you to bear in mind that all of Jah's feasts, again, as we said, are shadows of things to come. Isaiah 27, 12. And it shall come to pass in that day that Jah shall beat off from the channel of the river unto the stream of Egypt, and ye shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. And it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria, and the outcasts in the land of Egypt, and shall worship Jah in the holy mount at Jerusalem. So we see that there's a great trump trumpet to be to be blown here, right? This trumpet is blown here by either the archangels or even Jah himself. And I've seen in the scripture where it says, Jah will blow that himself. And I also know that even if an angel does blow it, it's, if Jah tells the angel to blow it, it's like Jah blowing it. It's like if Jah sends a messenger, like he sent his son to die for our sins and you disrespect you know, the Messiah or whatever, you're disrespecting the father because it's him in the flesh that way. But we can see this is a future time frame. So let's just get an intro to this feast here. First of all, when we get into Valvadis, you know, I like numbers. So you see the number one and seven. And this is not like numerology or some type of sorcery stuff. This is just understanding the Most High's numbers. You know, you'd have 12 apostles and 12 tribes and then 12 months of the year. There's nothing numerological about that, but it's just you can start to see that there's connections and patterns that the Most High has. And number one and number seven are part of great patterns and great fulfillment of Jah's prophecy. Now, because trumpets occurs on the first day, notice it's the first day of the seventh month called Ethanim. The meaning of this festival encompasses both the prophetic and symbolic meanings of the numbers one and seven. The symbolic meaning of the number one is unity and primacy. You know, it, it's the first and the number seven is symbolically and prophetically a number of termination like the end of a week completeness right seven sabbaths absolute or divine perfection finality or bringing to an end and it's no accident that job placed the feast of trumpets 14 days before the beginning of the celebration of the end of the great fall harvest the fall harvest prophetically celebrates the end of the spiritual harvest of humanity. If you remember about the, 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 the parable about the wheat and the tares, it says that the end of the world is the harvest. So this is why, again, we 
uh, find that the seventh month harvest season is also symbolic of the Messiah's second coming or our salvation that way. Numbers 29, verse 1. And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have an holy convocation. You shall do no servile work. It is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you, sounding it off. Leviticus 23, which you still read before. But let's look at this here. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, there's number seven. In the first day of the month, there's our number one. You shall have a Sabbath, the seventh day again, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. You should do no, you shall do no servile work therein, but offer an offering made by fire unto Jah. So again, notice that in Leviticus 23, verse 24, right up here, it's the first day, number one, of the seventh month. This Sabbath, again, is the seventh day of the week. Now, there's a lot more to prove this understanding, but this is what you would call one of Jah's anchors. His festivals, the beginning of the year, the seven-day Sabbath, these are all anchors. If you count the seven-day Sabbath throughout the year, you will have 52 Sabbaths, perfect, beginning from day one to day seven. And that would encompass all four seasons or the two great seasons of summer and winter all in one during a common year. So again, we're just looking at this, you know, the month that we talk about. So you notice at the top right, the first day of the month, it says you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of trumpets. Here it is. It's a Sabbath and it's the first day of the month. And when you count 10 days later, you got trumpets. When you count to the end of the 15th day here, you have the beginning of tabernacles. So from day one to right here, you can see is two weeks. From day one, you have number eight is the sec first week. And the number 15 is the second week. And you get right into the festivals, two Sabbaths. And then on the 23rd is the eighth day festival. And remember, we spoke about the number eight. It's like a new beginning. So even though this is the first day of the week, it would be the eighth day of the seven-day Feast of Tabernacles, if you understand. And this eighth day represents a new beginning and the new heavens and earth. And when we do speak about that in August during that time, it's a wonderful understanding of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of salvation. So we're going to look at the Day of Atonement. When the Day of Atonement does come up, it is August 15th, Sunday night, Sunday evening to Monday evening. It's considered the second day of the week. So let's look at it again. Understanding the seven-day Sabbath ends Saturday night. So that's seven days over. And then Saturday night begins that first day of the weekly cycle. And then Sunday night is the end of that first day. And then that's when you begin to keep the feast of, well, I shouldn't call it a feast, but it's called a festival. But anyways, the day of atonement where we fast, no food, no water for 24 hours. So says our scripture. And that's the second day of the week. Continuing, and just spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you. You shall afflict your souls, an offering, an offering made by fire. You shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before Jah your El. For whatsoever soul it, shall it be that shall not be afflicted, or shall not fast in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. Now, some people might say, hey, but I don't understand. I thought the Messiah was our atonement. So if Messiah died for our sins and he's our atonement, why would we need to go keep the day of atonement? Well, it's a shadow of things to come. And the Father put it in play. So, yes, you know, I think the Father's mercy will go far out to those who, for the last probably thousands of year, a thousand years or so, or hundreds of years, that there was no real big understanding of the festivals, let's say. But again, the way the scriptures look is that people were keeping these things. You just don't see them on the front page that way. But he will have mercy on who he will have mercy upon. And I pray that he has mercy upon those who might not known of these things, but would have kept them if they would have known. And that's, I think, what the Father does with all of us. He, re he reveals things to us when he knows that we're going to try to walk in that obedience. But He's not going to reveal things to us if he knows that, you know, we don't care about it. We won't walk in it or do it or fulfill it in any which way. 
And I think this is what he does look at in our minds. He looks at our motivation and why we want to do things. Your motivation is should only be to please him. That's why we were created. That's why the universe has been made to for Jah's pleasure, to please him. And those that don't please him will offend him. And you know that lake of fire thing is, is set up for the end for us. So we have to keep this day. It says you shall be cut off, right? That way, because it's a part of the atonement for Israel. Joel chapter 2, 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, which is the day of atonement. Ezra 8. Then I proclaimed the fast there at the river of ha Hava, Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our El, to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. I just brought these verses out here again just to show the atonement, having a fast, and for your life too. Fasting is really good. If you can fast, if you want to ask the Most High for, um, in prayer for something that, you know, a request, right? A spiritual request. Maybe you want to overcome a certain thing in your life. Maybe you want a, a more understanding or you want more strength to walk in his ways. There could be so many different things that you want from him spiritually. You don't fast and pray for money and all of that stuff, obviously, because the devil might give it to you and you might think it's Jah. Jah wants you to pray for spiritual things, right? And fasting is good. But this fasting here for the Day of Atonement is something that all believers should do. And again, you could join us on August the 15th, Sunday evening till Monday evening is a part of the fast. May the Most High strengthen you. Again, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn or a holy assembly. Now, as we look at tabernacles very quickly, again, this is the week of tabernacles and the eighth day. It's the week of August 21st to August 28th, or Sunday to Sunday. The first day of tabernacles, there's no work to be done. And um, Ethan M16, which is August 21st, the first day of the week, no work to be done. And then, of course, August 28th for the eighth day. But during the week now, you know, you can work. So from day six, seven, eight, nine, like so, yeah, for the week, except the seven day Sabbath. So I guess for five days, one, two, yeah, for five days or so, you're able to, you know, work, do your thing. But it's a time of a festival. And if it was back in the days, People call it the camping out festival where the Israelites would go to Jerusalem and, you know, make booths and tabernacles and like tents. And you would you would dwell in them and you'd be with the brethren them. And especially if the weather was good, the weather wasn't good. Obviously, you couldn't be um, doing you couldn't be celebrating tabernacles. But in Israel, the weather is perfect at that time as well. And even today, some people use this time to go camping. Now, they they probably observe tabernacles on a lunar calendar or the Enoch calendar. But I do know that there's some groups and even a couple of uh, Christian groups that honor the festivals, even though it's on a different calendar, they will go camping during this time. And that's not too bad. You can do that. But you don't have to go camping. You don't have to dwell in tents. But if you don't dwell in tents, just make sure you keep the intent of this a festival in, in your mind that way, especially if you live in cold areas or rainy areas. You know, a lot of people say, well, how come you're not building a tabernacle and living in it? It just, obviously, these times is not accommodating for that. Even if I would want to build a tabernacle in my backyard and stuff like that, it's, it's just, you know, that way it wouldn't make no sense. We don't need to. That's one thing I'm telling you. But if you want to, you, so be it. I'm not going to fight anybody. But just make sure you keep the first day holy, no work. And the seventh day holy, no work. And of course, the eighth day festival is no work as well. And you just fest have a good feast with the brethren them and have a nice good time that week in an upright way. Here's like a makeshift tabernacle, right? A little Gentile boy on the side there. Some people do their thing, right? If you want to make one in your backyard, you know, we've made one. I know we had a festival uh, one year, might have been a year, it might be last year or the year before, but we, you know, we had, I know my daughter was a part of, you know, setting up a little mini tabernacle and we kind of just, you know, we just built it uh, for that day. You know, we took a couple of pictures and let's say underneath it, so to speak. And we just, you know, recognize, try to reenact that kind of building, but no, we didn't stay in it and live in it for that week. But these are things you can do, especially with children. It's good to get them involved and 
we've always, since my children were a lot younger, we've always did stuff like either make a little a mini tabernacle and just put it at our house, or we would go into the bushes and just grab some sticks and do a certain thing and make a, a temporary uh, dwelling. But you don't need to, but it's a good thing to help encourage, you know, especially the young children to get involved and you teach them why these things happened. Because these are all physical things that teach high spiritual lessons. And then there's our eighth day, the last great day. And that'll occur August 29th. And that's coming up this year. Saturday, oh, I have 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. It should be 7 to 7. But that's still in Jerusalem. It might be that way. It's the first day of the week as well. No work, the same thing, the eight-day feast, just like the first day of Tabernacles, ending off the Feast of Tabernacles. Oh, praise John, hallelujah for this knowledge, wisdom, and understanding as we move in. we got a few more minutes, and I'm going to just share a few more things before we lock off on the Sabbath. What's the trumpet message? This is the trumpet message for everyone. Isaiah 58, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Where are we going to blow the trumpet? Jeremiah 51 says, set up a standard in the land, blow the trumpet among the nations. So this is what it's about. Showing our people our sins. We need to get back to the Most High. We need to repent. We need to keep the seven-day Sabbath. We need to eat only clean meats. We need to stop doing all the fun partying and all of that stuff that we're doing that we used to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. That is so challenging and tempting, as you, especially if you grew up in these things. The temptations are going to always be around you. They don't go away. you got to learn how to control your eyes, your desires, the pride of life. You know, and these are the things probably you might want to be praying and fasting for because it's challenging. And I know that men and women know this, you know, who are mature in the faith. They can say it's so challenging to walk every day, to govern your eyes, to govern your tongue, to speak the right things, to not have hatred in your heart, you know, and just to even not almost be too focused on the world and trying to get, get, get. It's, it's a challenge. And so these are part of what we want to show other people about their transgressions and have them walk in this narrow path, keep the commandments, statutes, keep the faith. And we have to do it with everybody, whether they're black or white, Israelites or Gentiles, so to speak, or Ethiopian and Gentiles, so to speak. It doesn't matter. The word Ethiopian is also synonymous for a black person when you look at it properly in historical and scriptural context. But nonetheless, all are invited you know, to come to this wedding feast of the Messiah. You just have to make sure you have your wedding garment, which is you believe in the Messiah's sacrifice. You ain't getting in on your own righteousness. You don't have no righteousness. Your righteousness is filthy rags. So you trust in him. And do you believe that he was perfect? Never sinned, never even thought it, never looked at a person with lust or a woman or anything like that, never hated anybody. You know, and if he got angry, which he did, it was righteous anger. It wasn't unholy anger. He overturned the money tables in his father's temple. They were turning it into like a, a marketplace and a den of thieves. He was angry when they were so stubborn that, you know, he asked them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or not? And they couldn't even answer him. And he was angry at their, their stubbornness, but he never sinned. And this is something to think about. Can you imagine not ever sinning and try, try not sinning, having any evil thoughts? Uh, I would say a week, but I even push you to a day or two. You'd be surprised, you know, when we start to see what go on and things come at your life. It's nothing, you know, any normal human can do. So we have to praise the Most High for sending His Son. We have to give honor to Joshua the same way we give honor to the, the Father. You can pray to Joshua, to the Messiah. You can ask for forgiveness in His name. You can ask, when you pray to the Father, you ask for everything based on His authority and your trust and your faith in Him. So this is what we got to do, and we got to do it now. Time is clicking. So as a watchman, we have a responsibility. You know, you have a responsibility too. You're a watchman over your own life, but there's certain people out there that might be watchmen for John, for different things. And you know what a watchman did, just like this guy, he, he sat upon the highest part of the town, usually near, usually near the town wall, the cities, or the city, I should say, the cities were, you know, 
built around with great walls. Like you couldn't climb up these things. You can't put ladders. These are thick walls, fortified. But there would be like a tower there on the wall as well where this the man can look all the way over and see if there's anybody sneaking up. And he was trained in this area. You'd have to do it at nighttime. You'd have to have listening, all kind of thing. Because his duty was to protect the city of Jerusalem or whatever city it might be and protect the people. So we have a we have a responsibility. So do you. Again, you don't have to be teaching online like me, but when you're sharing things with other people, you're a watchman. Are you your brother or your sister's keeper? That's the question. And I hope the answer is you recognize that it might be yes. Don't think it might not be. And I'm not trying to say hug up with people who hate you and stuff like that, but you know, it says when people don't like you, you put coal, you heap coals of you put coals of fire on their head. But remember, when you're putting the coals of fire on their head, too, I just want to say this. It's not that you're burning them up. Like, if they're wicked to you, and you're like, oh, I'll just be nice to them and kind, and, and then I'm just heaping this coal so they can burn up. It's really a metaphor to say that the coals are something that is, gives heat, and it's going to burn their conscience. So when you're dealing with somebody who you know don't like you and treat you bad and everything, and then you continually treat them like almost like nothing going on, you treat them with respect. You even go an extra mile for them, so to speak, to be courteous and respectful in your eyes. It's going to start burning their conscience. And they're going to notice that with how they're feeling about you and treating you is really wicked. And if that person is really wicked and has no conscience to judge, then, you know, make the coal of fire burn them up too. Same way, right? So the watchman is to warn the assembly. It says, blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain that all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of Jah's coming, for it is nigh at hand. You got to be fearing Jah right now. Be terrified of Jah. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Don't worry about the devil. Even though you can't fight him and deal with him, he don't have power over your life. You know, he can maybe try to kill you, but you can't take away your eternal life or anything. Fear Jah. The day of Jah is coming, and that's the judgment. When the Messiah comes, that's dealing with the day of Jah. And even a little bit before, it's when he's going to reconcile all the righteousness and get rid of this wicked, the wickedness that is in this world. And if you are offending in it, or I am too, we're not going to be a part of it. But people are not going to take heed to it. Jeremiah 6, verse 17. Also, I set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. Ezekiel 7.14. They have blown the trumpet even to make all ready, but none go to the battle. Do you hear the sound of the trumpet to repent? Do you hear this message here in any of our teachings and lessons? Or do you want to be a part of you know being a watchman and sounding this trumpet? Again, it's up to you if you have faith. But make sure you know the sound of the trumpet. You know the sound. Is it, a, is it the sound of war? Is it the sound of recollecting yourself is it the sound of gathering the elders isn't an alarm to run you have to understand and distinguish the sound of the trumpet and obviously i'm speaking spiritually right not audibly um, that way so the watchman of zion's responsibilities are this ezekiel 33 if when he sees the sword come upon the land he blows the trumpet and warn the people then whosoever hears the sound of the trumpet and takes not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. So just like anything in terms of, I uh, remember Hurricane Katrina when it came there, over there in that place, I forgot, I don't know if it's called, wherever they have the Mardi Gras thing there, right? And... You know, they were warned when Katrina came that, hey, oh, this thing is coming. It's big, man. It's going to wash away things. And there's some people like, nah, man, don't worry about that. We went through a couple of before. And they never took heed to that warning. And they got washed away. You understand? Many people died because they stayed home. They didn't go to the high ground. They didn't take heed to the watchman's warning. But you know what? I noticed that some people do too. Say the watchman gives a sound and the warning. And then he says, oh, get ready. And then peop the storm doesn't really come. Well, if the storm doesn't come, the watchman is still doing his job because it looked like it was supposed to come, but whatever, it got diverted. But the people who hear the watchman, they might say to themselves, oh, you know what, man? The last time you blew the, blew the trumpet, told us to go, nothing happened, so forget it this time. But remember, that's the watchman's job. 
So take warning when you hear these things in your mind and in your spirit and in your heart. Now, if the watchman see the sword come and he doesn't blow the trumpet and the people be not warned and the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So yes, the watchman doesn't blow the trumpet. Wickedness comes on the people and whoever dies, they die in their own iniquity. But also the watchman is going to get some blame for it big time as well because he still didn't warn the wicked person of what was to come even though the wicked person probably was scheduled to die anyways. But again, the job is to warn people. So remember, as we finish off here, we preachers are trumpets. 1 Corinthians 14. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise you, except you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. Jeremiah 4. My bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very heart. My heart, my mind maketh a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace, because thou hast heard, O my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. So again, it's good that when we do teach, we use words that can be easily understood. Not like going to like a church and you hear people speaking so-called tongues and nobody don't understand a word what's going on here. But that's another story. But the thing is, again, when we're bringing, speaking to people, we don't want to just try to, and I've been through the stages, trying to show them how much scripture knowledge you have. And you might have a lot. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But when your motivation is just to show off and be boasty with it, and it's not really there to uplift the person, to bring the person closer to truth, to guide them to maybe repent, then your motivation is a little bit off and you got to get back on track again. Always remember, you know, why just giving you knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. It's to help others, to pull them out of the fire, and of course, to keep yourself out of the fire as well. Here's the last, I think this, let me see this, I think this is my last um, slide here. Let me just make sure. Yeah, my last two slides here, family. So we're talking about this great and dreadful day of Jah, dealing with the trumpet, Zephaniah 1. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. See, when the Messiah comes, people think it's going to be, oh, this is so happy. This is a description of what's going to happen. A day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men, that they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against Jah, and their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of Jah's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a spitty riddance of all them that dwell in the land. That's right. It's a dark day, a day of the trumpet. So in view of these facts... Isaiah 18 says, All ye inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, see ye when he lifteth up an ensign on the mountains, and when he bloweth a trumpet, hear ye. So when the trumpet's blown, hear. In other words, let all on earth, let all the people in the world watch when the signal is raised, and take heed when the trumpet is blown. My prayer is that you got some understanding as you prepare for the Feast of Trumpets. And we're going to talk about the Feast of Trumpets next week. Now, fuller understanding, going into the seven trumpets and prophecy and trying to just, you know, bring this understanding to comfort our spirit, our minds that way and to increase and build our faith. Hope you got some understanding. Thank you for listening. All glory and praise to Jah our Father and His Son, Joshua the Messiah, who died for our sins. He's the Son of the Most High Jah. He existed before all things, all any creation. He was with the Father in eternity. He's the first and he's the last. The Father is the immortal one from the beginning. Any, well, there is no beginning when it comes to the immortal one. He was always there. But nonetheless, it's both the Father and the Son. The Father is the Holy Spirit. There is no Trinity. And Joshua, although he is the Father in the flesh, he's not the Father, so to speak. But he should be treated like the Father, given all honor and glory. He has all power and everything. And he's the doorman. So if you want to get to the Father, you have to go through the Son. 
So he's Ja the son, and there's Ja the father, and Ja the son's name is Joshua, Jesus, Yahushai, Yahusha, Yeshaya. Uh, some would say Emmanuel even. He's the one you put your trust in. Bless up, and again, thank you for listening. I'll look in the room here. Shalom to everybody. Phil Chavez. Lorraine Chavez be healed of memory loss, hearing loss, high blood pressure, all body aches and pain be restored to excellent health from head to, to toe. Now in Joshua's name, so be it. And my prayer, brother, if that's a prayer request for a family member, I will say this right now. Let's pray. I pray, Heavenly Father, if this is in sincerity and truth, that you hear the prayer of Phil Chavez. And if they are believers in you, and if they're not believers in you, open up their understanding and call them. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you hear the prayer of the brother and you just guide him and hear his prayers that he may, you may heal this woman here, and her name is Lorraine. You may heal Lorraine, but most importantly, forgive her for her sins and give her a sound mind. If it is your will, Jah, let it be done. I pray through the glory and name of your son, Joshua the Savior, in faith and in truth, so be it. All right, family. All right. Yes. Again, thank you for listening. Uh, don't feel no way to even even when you have, uh, if you can put some comments in, not in just the chat here, but in the comment section, that helps a lot. Share this link out there. Uh, contact me if you need anything. I'm available for all those. And if those want to visit me, you know where I'm at too, making those moves. Praise John. So I'll just wait. And then we shall shut it down. Yeah, and Sister Janessa, I went to, um, what was it called? Israel Church of Jesus. Yeah, it was a nice little vibe there still. It's in small, like the quite intimate groups. And uh, there was good teaching on truth there, as far as I heard from that. And I know that they keep a different calendar, but not bad, you know. It was peaceful. And um, hopefully, you know, we'll be sharing with each other that way, um, us and them. I gave them some handouts and let them know who we are and, May the Most High do his work, right? And add. All right, family. That is it. Shalom. And yes, yes, they are very small and humble. Yeah, man. Bless up.